you for the invitation. So the nice thing about this web seminar is that you have a much larger audience than you would have usually in a seminar. Um, yeah, let me, before, well, maybe, before I start with the talk in earnest, let me indulge it a little bit in the past. Okay, I have to move here. Um, so what you see here is the top part of the title page of my very first published paper. Uh, I can see it um, was fairly short, six pages. So, so you can see my mouse cursor here. Um, and it appeared in Archiv der Mathematik in 1992. So I wrote it while I was still an undergraduate in Munich. Um, Cornelius Greiter, who was an assistant at the time, pointed me to this problem. So you can see it's about iterates of polynomials. You have polynomial x squared plus a with an integer a. You look at the iterates of this. And the question is about the Galois groups of these polynomials. And um, there was a conjecture, I think, by Udoni who conjectured that the Galois group, when you take the constant term to be one, so iterates of x squared plus one, um, it'll always be the maximal possible Galois group you can have um, for, yeah, for iterated quadratic polynomials. Concretely, this means that the nth iterate should have Galois group, the pseudo two subgroup of the symmetric group acting on two to the n letters. So two to the n roots of the nth iterate. Um, and so Cornelius thought that I might be able to do something about this and turned out that he was right. So I did this and um, so you can see the, the main theorem um, of the paper. So I was able to show that for, well, infinitely many integers, say integers that are positive and one or two mod four or negative divisible by four and such that minus a is not a square um, these Galois groups really are the largest possible ones. And of course, this includes the case that A is one, so the original problem. Now, at the time, this looked like a kind of isolated curiosity maybe, and so the paper didn't have much of an impact at first. So I think it got its first citation 10 years later, 2002, um, but then, um, yeah, so two things happened, or yeah. The one is that people started to look at um, arboreal Galois representations. So that's a term coined, I think, by Nigel Boston. You look at um, how the Galois group of the rational numbers, for example, in this case, um, acts on the rooted infinite tree. So in the case of these quadratic polynomials and their iterates, you get a natural action on an a rooted infinite binary tree. And then you can look at yeah, the action of the Galois group. Um, and so one can um, phrase the theorem I proved there that for, for these values of A, what you get is a surjective representation. So the Galois group gives you the full automorphism group of this infinite binary tree, which is maybe an interesting result if you look at it in this way. And um, also there's this field of arithmetic dynamics that's become fashionable. I think this was pushed um, to some extent by Joe Silverman, um, which studies arithmetic properties of iterates of maps of an algebraic nature. So for example, polynomials, and of course, questions about Galois groups or irreducibility, which is what we will look at in this talk, um, that they naturally fit in there. And so this, little paper of mine has been uh, picking up citations at ever increasing pace in the last 10 to 15 years. And so last time I looked, and this was yesterday, it was just one citation short of making the list of my top five most cited papers, which um, I find, find rather surprising. The nice thing is that what I did back then actually has some connection to things I'm doing now. And um, so what I'm doing now is mostly related to questions about rational points on curves and hyperliptic curves in particular. And um, yeah, we will see how hyperliptic curves come into this picture. So let me switch back to the present um, and sort of define the notions that I'm going to use. And I want to say that if you have questions during the talk, please do not hesitate to 
raise your hand virtually or write in the chat and then I'll try to answer them. So we want to look at iterates of polynomials, quadratic polynomials um, in particular. And then, I mean, it's easy to see that up to some um, f linear transformation, so conjugation by an f linear transformation, you can always write a polynomial in this form. They just have x squared plus a constant. So in my paper, I used a for the constant. Um, I'm switching here to c because it's a, the more usual notation. And um, I allow c to be any rational number, not just an integer. So fc of x is this polynomial, and then I can define the iterates. So I start with the zeroth iterate, and it should correspond to the identity map. So it's just given by the polynomial x. And the first is the polynomial itself. And then the second I obtain by plugging in the polynomial into itself. So I take x squared plus c, all squared plus c. And then I continue, and in general, I have that the n plus first iterate of fc well, there are two ways of writing this down. I can sort of plug in the end iterate into FC or plug in FC into the end iterate. And of course I get the same result, but sometimes it's um, more helpful to look at it in this way. And sometimes it's more helpful to look at it in this way here. So I get a sequence of polynomials. And of course the degree doubles in each step. So the degree of the end iterate will be two to the power N. And then of course I can, uh, I can ask questions about these polynomials. So the question I was dealing with in this paper was about the Galois group of or the Galois groups of, of these polynomials in the sequence. Um, in this talk, we will ask a kind of weaker question. So the question will not be whether we get the largest possible Galois group, but just whether the Galois group acts transitively on the roots, or um, put another way whether these polynomials are irreducible or for which values of the parameter C and which indices N is this nth iterate irreducible. So if I fix C, then I get this the sequence of iterates of FC. And then um, looking at, at this way of writing the N plus first iterate, it's pretty clear that as soon as the nth iterate is reducible, then you have a factorization and this factorization is inherited by the next one since we just plug in something into the polynomial. And so there are basically two possibilities. One is that all the polynomials are reducible. And the other one is that they are reducible up to some point. And then the next one is, uh, they are irreducible, sorry, up to some point. And the next one is reducible and then it has to stay reducible. So, there's this kind of dichotomy and um, well, in the case that not all the polynomials are irreducible, of course, one can ask at which point they stop being irreducible and become reducible. And then if you look at examples, you may come up with this conjecture. So as far as I know, this is compatible with all the evidence that's available. And um, this is sort of all the best possible conjecture that you can make in this context and it says that if we only require the second iterate to be irreducible then it will never happen that at some point later in the sequence the polynomial becomes reducible so if the second one is irreducible then all the later ones have to be irreducible as well so why is this best possible um well it definitely does occur that well the first iterate so the polynomial itself is reducible uh, when you take c to be a negative square, then of course you can factor fc, and then all the polynomials from the first on mm, will be reducible. But it's also possible that the first one is irreducible and the second one is reducible, and it's um, not too hard exercise to work out for which values of c this, this occurs. And this is this remark down here. So the first case is when the first iterate, the polynomial itself, is already reducible. And the second case is when um, the second iterate is reducible, but the first is irreducible. So there's an infinite family of parameters where this happens. Yeah, but conjecturally, um, these are the only two possibilities. And then as soon as the second one is irreducible, 
it should stay that way. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the topic and maybe to, to take out the suspense immediately, I will not prove this conjecture in this talk, but I will, um, I will improve what is known about it. Okay, so to, to be able to say something about this, we need to, to be able to detect if at some point in our sequence, we switch from irreducible to reducible. And um, to do this, we have this lemma here. So if we are at the point in the sequence where we have an irreducible iterate, so the nth iterate is irreducible, but the next one becomes reducible, then um, this implies that the constant term of this next iterate has to be a square. So let me give a proof because it's not so hard and um, every talk should contain a proof, I think. So the first thing to note here is that our n plus first iterate is, is an even polynomial because we plug in x squared plus c into the nth iterate. So it's a polynomial that only depends on x squared. And so if I think of the factorization into reducibles um, and I substitute minus x for x in the factors, then up to changing the sign if the degree is odd, I get another irreducible factor of the same polynomial. So I get an evolution on the set of monic irreducible factors of my polynomial, the n plus first iterate. Now I can look at fixed points. So if I have a fixed point of this involution, then there are two cases. The polynomial that's fixed is an even polynomial or it's an odd polynomial. When it's an even polynomial, then um, it's a polynomial that depends only on x squared. So I can also write it as a polynomial that depends only on x squared plus c. And then um, I have a factor here that's a polynomial in x squared plus c. So this gives me a factor of the nth iterate which by assumption does not exist um, if my fixed point is a proper factor, which it must be because I assume that the n plus first iterate is reducible. So it cannot be, I mean, I'm looking at the irreducible factors and so the whole thing cannot be an irreducible factor. When my fixed point is odd, yeah, the only odd irreducible polynomial is x itself. And then for degree reasons, it follows that x squared has to be a factor and then I can argue in the same way. So whenever I have a fixed point, I get a factorization of the nth iterate, which I don't have by assumption. So there are no fixed points. And this, well then, um, if I have no fixed points of my involution, then I can, well, all the orbits have size two. And so I can pick one representative of each orbit and take the product and I call this H and then um, the other representatives I get by substituting minus x for x. Take the product, I get h of minus x. So one, one little thing here is one has to um, note that the degree of h is even because the degree of the n plus first iterate is at least four, power of two that is at least four. So I get h of minus x and not minus h of minus x here. And so the actual is that I can write this polynomial as the polynomial of h of x and h of minus x. And then, then, then I can just plug in zero to get that the constant term of f n plus first iterate is the square of the constant term of h. And this proves the lemma. So I can I have a way of detecting um, when I switch from irreducible to reducible. But I should um, add here that this is only one direction, um, so that's it's not an equivalence, but um, so it gives me a necessary condition for switching from reducible to from irreducible to reducible, and therefore a sufficient condition for staying irreducible when I turn this around. Yeah, so here's an example that shows that it's not an equivalence. Um, if I take for the parameter c the value one third and look at the second iterate, I get this polynomial here which has square constant term, but still is irreducible. Okay. So we use this um, to show that, well, if the second iterate is irreducible, then 
some some others also have to be. So what is known about this? Um, so we have to look at the constant term of these iterates. That's why I introduced this notation. So capital A N of C is the constant term of the nth iterate of F C. So starts with zero. I mean, the zeroth iterate is just X has no constant term. Then F itself has constant term C and then I get C squared plus C and so on. And I mean, I, I can define it by this recursion here. And then the question is, well, is this, or for which C is this a square? And so the, the first, well, I, I will assume that the second iterate is irreducible. So the first interesting case is when N is two in the lemma, which means I have to look at the constant term of the third iterate, which is A3 of C. And um, yeah, it's, you know, I'll say something about this right in a few seconds. So one can show that A3 of C can be a square only when C is zero. Of course, when C is zero, then all the A's are zero and are squares. And A4 of C is a square only when C is zero or minus one. Yeah, when, when C is minus one, then all the even ones are um, zero and therefore squares. Um, yeah, how, how can one see this? So for A3, I mean, from, from what I've written here, you can see that a n of C is a polynomial in C with integral coefficients of degree two to the power n minus one. So for A3, I get a polynomial of degree four. And um, so this equation here defines a genus one curve and it has special points, so it's an elliptic curve. And then one easily can determine that it has rank zero and find its rational points. And um, so, I mean, it has three rational points, but two of them are at infinity. And so the only rational point that's not at infinity is the point that corresponds to C equals zero here. For A4, we get a polynomial of degree eight. And so we get, I mean, these equations y squared equals a polynomial in x define hyperliptic curves. So when the degree here is eight, then this is a curve of genus three. And um, yeah, one can um, look at the Jacobian variety and the Boolean variety of dimension three in which I can embed the curve. And so the group of rational points on this Boolean variety is a finitely generated Boolean group by modular way. Um, and it turns out that this group is finite. So there are only finitely many rational points on the Jacobian and um, embedding the curve. They only find many rational points on the curve and I can find them by looking at the pre-images of the finitely many points on the Jacobian. And um, it's not too hard to figure out that the only points here are given by, by these two X coordinates. So this is in a paper by Rafe Jones, Nate Hins and a few other people. And um, at some point I also joined as a co-author. So, I mean, you can find it in the archive and it also has appeared by now in the New York Journal of Mathematics. So this implies that um, when we have the parameter C such that the second iterate is irreducible, and I should mention that um, when C is zero or minus one, then this is definitely not the case because then FC itself, well, F zero is X squared and F minus one is X squared minus one. They are both reducible. So in this case, all the polynomials are reducible. But if it's irreducible, then C is not zero or minus one. And then by the lemma, or well then, I mean, this proposition tells us that A3 of C and A4 of C both are non-squares. And then by the lemma, this implies that the third and the fourth iterate are also irreducible. So it can go from two to four. And the main um, thing I want to do in the talk is to go one step further. So from four to five. And this basically means that I have to figure out for which values of C, A5 of C can be a square. And the result will be that this only happens when C is zero. Again, yeah, similarly to A3 of C. Okay, so that's the goal. Um, now, A5 of C is a polynomial of degree 16, but it has no constant term. So maybe I, I just go 
back quickly to this slide here. Yeah, you see, I mean, F C C squared plus C, and then the square of something that ends in C plus C will always have zero constant term. So um, it's, it has a factor of C. And then it's more convenient to work with an equation for the hyperplectic curve where the polynomial on the right hand side has odd high, on the right hand side has odd degree. And so I basically just turn it around, um, I place a polynomial capital A5 by lowercase a5, which is x to the power 16 times capital A5 evaluated at 1 over x. This is now a polynomial of degree 15 um, because the constant term of capital A5 is 0. So the degree drops by 1. Um, <clears throat> and then the question is equivalent to, to this. So I mean, the points where c is 0 for y squared equals a capital A5 of x um, now move to infinity. And the points that were at infinity before now, now move to 0. And um, so I, I have two points at infinity on the curve that comes from the capital A5. They move to 0, so they will be there. And they, the other point moves to infinity. And um, what I want to, to know is that there are no other points. Yeah. So if my lowercase a5, I can write in this form. I mean, it just comes from the recurrence. And um, so I'm looking at this curve, which I call c. y squared equals little a5 of x, which is this polynomial. Um, it has degree 15, so we get you know, 7 here. And we want to know what the rational points are on this curve. So the usual way of, of trying to, to do this is to look at the Jacobian variety again. I mean, I've told you that for A4, um, they have this genus 3 curve and it's Jacobian variety. And it turns out that the group of rational points on the Jacobian variety is finite. Um, in general, when the rank of this group, this finitely generated abelian group, group of rational points on the Jacobian is strictly smaller than the genus of the curve, which is the dimension of the Jacobian, then you have a chance of applying Chabotis method. So Chabotis proved Model's conjecture that there are only finitely many rational points on the curve of higher genus um, in the special case when the rank of the model Bay group, group of rational points on the Jacobian is um, less than the genus. Um, and one can make this approach at least, let's say, effective in practice. Um, but this requires some, some knowledge of the model Bay group. So the first thing one has to, to do is one has to figure out what the rank is, or at least show that it's smaller than the genus. And the way of doing this is that one um, finds an upper bound for the rank by computing a certain uh, suitable Selma group. And for hyperliptic for curves, uh, for the curves of hyperliptic curves, one can compute the two Selma group um, relatively easily. And so in this case, if we do this, we get an upper bound for the rank, which is two. So we know that the, the rank of the group of rational points on the Jacobian is at most two, and two is less than seven. So in principle, Chabotis method should work. Um, I mean, there are general results that would allow us to deduce a bound on the number of rational points from this information, but this will not be enough. I mean, what we want to show is that, is that this curve has only three rational points, you know, the one point at infinity and the two points when x is zero, then I mean, the right hand side simplifies to one and I have two points, one with y equal to one and one with y, y equal to minus one. And um, I want to know that there are no other points but the bound that I get just out of knowing that the rank is at most two will never be three, but always be larger. So to really get at the points, I would have to know um, what the rank is, not just an upper bound. And then I would also have to know um, the right number of independent points in this group to do the computations I, I have to do. But the problem is that um, I cannot find points of infinite order in this group. Um, so I mean, yeah, this is a seven dimensional object and 
searching for points there is, is not so trivial and um, also I just have this upper bound so it's perfectly possible that the rank is um, is actually zero but I have no good way of, of proving this. So I'm sort of stuck here because I, I cannot go further and apply the method in the usual in the usual way. So that's what I mean by standard Chabot T techniques here. I also have to do something different. And this is this so-called Selma group Chabot T method that showed up in the title. Um, which I will explain on the next slide. Um, but first, I want to note that, I mean, the three points we know on the curve, the three rational points, the point at infinity and the two points with x coordinate zero, they all have the property that if I embed the curve into the Jacobian in the usual way here where we take the point at infinity as the base point, um, then, well, of course, the point at infinity, the base point will map to the origin. So it has order one and the other two points also have finite order and the order is odd. I mean, it's 15 as one can figure out here. So we have three points of odd order. Um, and in fact, these are the only points of odd order on the curve. Okay, now what's the idea for the Seba group Chabotti? Um, so I mean, basically, we don't have the we don't have points in, in this model A group. Um, we do have the Selma group, and so basically we would like to use the information we have, so the Selma group as a kind of proxy for the model A group. And so we look at the following diagram. Um, so for the time being, I mean, you, you don't really have to know what the two Selma group is, only um, that there's a map like this. So, I mean, we have the curve, the rational points on the curve. We have an embedding of the curve into the Jacobian given by mapping the point at infinity to zero. Um, so this also sends the rational points on the curve to into the rational points on the Jacobian. This is a group. So I can um, take the subgroup that consists of doubles of elements <laughs> and look at the quotient. And then the Selma group, the two Selma group, um, there's an injective homomorphism from this group into the Selma group. So the two Selma group is a finite abelian group that's killed by two, so vector space over the field of two elements. And so this is just the F2 linear map here. Then the next step is to look at the same thing over the two adding numbers. So of course, we still have the embedding of the curve. Um, we have the group of Q2 rational points on the Jacobian and so this quotient. And um, the Selma group, two Selma group has a natural map into this quotient. So not just for Q2, but for, for every completion, but we only need it, every completion of Q, we will only need it for Q2 here. Now, um, the Q2 points of the Jacobian form a two adic Lie group. So, I mean, I can do analysis over the two adic numbers. And um, this two adic Lie group has a logarithm map that I can arrange so that um, it has image the two adic integers to the power g. g is the genus seven in our case. And then I can. I mean, I, I can take the reduction modulo two of, of something in here. I get something in F2 to the G and um, sort of completing the square here, I, I get the kind of reduced logarithm map on this quotient. I'll just take a pre-image here, take a log and then the reduction. So we will work with this diagram. And um, so the sketch of the proof is like this. So we need to know that this map sigma here is actually injective, which we can check because we know the Selma group, so we can compute it. Um, and then our goal is to show that the set CQ odd that I defined on the previous slide, which consists of the three known points, um, is all of the set of rational points. So I want to show that if I have a rational point that's not one of these, um, I get the contradiction, so the point cannot exist. So how can I do this? Well, I, I take my point P here 
I map it into the Jacobian. So this is I of P. In the simplest case, this point maps to something non-zero here, which means that it's not divisible by two. And then it will map to something non-zero here because it's, in, it's injective and also here because sigma is injective. Um, and I get something non-zero here, hopefully. And I can check that what I get here is sort of not in the image of stuff that comes from, from the curve down here. That's the idea. But in general, of course, it's possible that my point is divisible by two. Yeah, and then I would get zero here. And this would not be sufficient to conclude something. So what I do is I divide the point by two as many times as possible. Um, so n is maximal. And this, this makes sense because the only points in the Jacobian that I can divide by two um, arbitrary often are the points of odd order. And these are the points I have excluded here. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't write it on the slide, the previous slide, but these three points are the only points on the curve that map to something of odd order in the Jacobian. So any other point will not be a point of odd order on the Jacobian and so can be divided by two only a finite number of times. Now I can play the game I sketched before with Q. So Q is a point here. And basically I map Q from here to here in the two possible ways, going this way or, or this way. Um, and I mean, going this way, I see that it has to come from some element in the Selmer group. So it maps to something that's in the image of, of this map, log bar composed with sigma. On the other hand, um, yeah, I mean, so that's, that's what I know. And um, the logarithm of Q is the same as two to the minus n times the logarithm of I of P because the logarithm is a linear map. And now to get a contradiction, I consider points that are Q2 points on the curve, map them over here, um, write them in this form and then figure out what they map to here. And if I can show that no matter which point I take here, which is not one of these points of order, of course, ends up here um, in some element that's not in the image of this map, then this shows that, well, since every rational point also is a, is a Q2 point, this shows that these rational points cannot exist. Uh, so that's the, the idea of the proof. And um, so we, we use the two Selma group here, which captures some information on the model Vey group um, so of to replace the model Vey group, which we don't know explicitly enough in the Chabotie argument. Okay, so I have to say a little bit more about the Selma group and how we compute them. Um, so we have this polynomial of degree 15, which is on the right-hand side of our curve equation. It turns out to be irreducible. So I um, write theta for a root, and then I take the number field that's generated by, by this root, which is a number field of degree 15. Yeah, then um, for every field extension of Q, which I call L here, I can look at the L rational points on the Jacobian and this quotient, which we have seen for Q and Q2 on the previous slide. And then there's a certain map, which I can write down and which I will, which I will tell you um, how I can define it into, um, well, K is, is this number field here. So I take L tensor K and then the multiplicative group modulo squares. So this does not have to be a field, but it will be the direct product of fields. And the point is that the two Selma group can be identified with a subgroup of this when I take Q here. So then I just get K instead of L tensor K. So subgroup of the square classes of K um, such that when I take the, the, the obvious map to the same thing when I take QV here for completion of Q. So I take K tensor QV over Q um, the square classes in that. I have this map over QV. Um, and then the Selma group is the subgroup of this consisting of elements that map 
to the image of, of this map for all QV. So that are sort of locally in the image. Now, I mean, this, this, is a con yeah, this is a condition for infinitely many completions. And so if I want to compute something, I have to cut it down to some, something finite. And um, the way to do this is to, to say that the elements in the image or the elements that belong to the Selmer group um, have to be unramified in a certain sense at most primes. Um, and in this case, so because the discriminant of this polynomial is odd and square free, and the class group of this number field is trivial, as one can show by computation, um, one gets that the two Selmer group actually sits in the square classes that come from units. Also, uh, instead of just elements of K. And um, the only condition that I have to satisfy then is the, uh, it's essentially the condition that comes from, from the completion at two and at infinity. So if you remember the previous slide, one thing we had to check is that the map sigma from the Selmer group to um, the group jq2 mod 2jq2 is injective. And this is something we can sort of check on, on the right-hand side of these maps. So we know the Selmer group is contained in here. And um, if I take q2 here, I get a similar thing on the right-hand side, which is just this ring. Um, so two elegant integers. And then I have to join theta, take the, the units, modulo squares. And so I can just check that this map is injective. That's a finite computation. And this implies that sigma is injective as well. OK, but I still have to, to figure out what my image is over Q2 to really determine the Selma group. And so maybe that is a little bit technical, but um, that's a way of writing down this, this map pretty explicitly. Um, given a certain way of representing elements of the Jacobian. So maybe I don't go too much into detail here. I mean, if you want to know more, you can ask. Um, but so one, one thing I have to do is I have to figure out what the image is of JQ2 or 2J of Q2 in this, um, this group here. And um, well, this, um, Z2 replacing L here. And um, so basically what I, what I need is a basis of this group here as a vector space over F2. And um, because the curve has a fairly special shape, it's possible to write down such a basis. So um, if I take this polynomial, take its roots as X coordinates of points on the curve and then pick suitable Y coordinates and take the images of these points in Jacobian, and then I take their sum, I get a point in JQ2. And if I do this for all these polynomials, I get the basis of this. So it's possible to, to show this by some fairly explicit computation. And um, this allows me to figure out what the image of this map delta Q2 is, and therefore what the two Selmer group is. And in this way, I, I see that um, the two Selmer group has rank two, and this gives me the bound on the rank. But I also have an explicit representation of the two Selmer group that I can use for computations. Okay, so um, we have this, and then we have this logarithm map. So we need to be able to, to compute this. And um, by the logarithms are, the logarithm is obtained by integrating differentials on the curve or invariant one forms on the Jacobian. Um, and so one way of doing this is where we, we define the logarithm um, by integrating differentials from this point infinity to the point P. So one needs a periodic integration theory for that, which does exist and um, which I cannot go into further here. So this defines my logarithm on points that are images of points on the curve. And then the image of the curve generates the Jacobian. And so I, I, get, it, I get it on the Jacobian by extending it linearly. 
Okay, now, I mean, our goal is to show that the three points we know are the only three rational points. Um, and the way we will prove this is we will look at each of these points and then show that there's no other point that's too adequately close to it. So we begin with this point P0, which is the point zero one. Um, as I said, it's a torsion point of odd order even. And so the logarithm is zero because the logarithm is a homomorphism into a torsion free group. Now, near this point, we can expand this map log um, as a tuple of formal power series in the uniformizer at this point, which we can take to be the x coordinate. And um, then, I mean, looking at this, one can show that uh, one can determine the radius of convergence of these power series. And um, so these power series converge when the two adic valuation of the x coordinate is a little bit larger than zero. So definitely for all rational numbers um, that whose, whose numerator is divisible by two. And um, using this, because the points that are involved in this basis of JQ2 over two JQ2 that you saw on the previous slide, they all satisfy this, this condition here. We can just compute the logarithms by evaluating the power series. And this way we can, um, we can determine the basis of, so I mean, yeah, the way I've, I've defined it, um, the logarithm maps into Q2 to the power G, but um, by evaluating the logarithm at this basis, representatives of this basis, we get, um, we get a Z2 basis of the image. And this allows us to identify the image of the logarithm with Z2 to the G. Okay. So now we, we consider points that are close to P naught in the true edic sense. Um, so I compose the logarithm with this isomorphism I had in the previous slide to get a version of the logarithm, which I now call log prime, that subjects onto Z2 to the G. So that's the logarithm that was in the diagram on the slide before. And um, yeah, then I have to figure out the the image of this map log bar composed with sigma. And I can just do that and um, picking a suitable basis of my space here, I have these two explicit generators. So and this is an F2 vector space, G dimensional. So I have G tuples of elements of F2 and um, both these generators have the property that the first and the last coordinate are zero. Yeah, so this is the only thing that we need to, to remember here. And then, um, yeah, so computing this power series that gives this modified logarithm. So it's the original logarithm. And then I multiplied by some matrix. Um, we can compute this and we get this. So up to O of two squared terms. So we have a T here, T squared here, and then everything else has more powers of two and higher powers of T. So this is, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at points that are, so have the same reduction as P naught mod two. So they have an even X coordinate. So I write this as two times T. And so, well, I have to, to work out what the images are for all these points. Um, so when t is odd, then I have something odd here, something odd here, and everything else is even. So I get this point if I reduce mod two, one, one, and then zeros. But it has a one in the first component, so it's not in this image. And when t is even and non-zero, then, well, I have this t here and everything else is always at least t squared or two times t, or actually four times t, and so, this term here will be the one that has the smallest theoretic valuation. And if I divide by the highest possible power of T, this gives me something odd and everything else is even. And so I get this element and I reduce mod two and still has a one in the first component. So it's not in the image of the same group. And this shows that um, there's no, no rational point other than the ones with X coordinate zero that has positive theoretic valuation of the X coordinate. 
So that deals with, with these points. And then we do basically the same kind of thing with the point at infinity. And then we still have to look at points that have odd x coordinate. So let's do that. But it will be, I mean, yeah. So for the point near, points in infinity, it will be very similar. Um, so by this, I mean points that have negative two adic valuations. So the x coordinate has a two in the denominator. Um, I can write down a uniformizer at this point at infinity, which is this here. And then again, um, write down my logarithm in terms of power series in this uniformizer. And well, this gives the following. So I get stuff that involves of higher order things. And then the last coordinate, I get minus t plus two t squared plus, plus something divisible by four. And so this makes it pretty clear that regardless what t is, this last term will be dominant. Yeah, we'll be have, we'll have the smallest theoretic valuation. And so if I divide by a power of two and reduce, I will always get this element. And this is a one in the last component and therefore will not be in the image of the Selmer group. And so by the same reasoning, this shows that the point infinity is the only rational point that has x coordinate with negative to adic valuation. So this leaves points where the valuation is zero. And then by looking at the equation modulo eight, you see that um, this can only be the case when the x coordinate is congruent to minus three modulo eight. Um, and all these points give the same, the same image under delta Q2, which is non zero. And um, this is not in the image of the Selmer group. So this shows that these points also cannot exist. And um, this proves what we want to prove. So yeah, the only point coordinates are the points with x coordinate zero. The only point with x coordinate that is, has, is, has even denominator is the point infinity and there are no other points. So this finishes the proof that um, a five of C is a square only when C is zero. And um, this sort of extends the, what we know about the conjecture from the beginning by saying that um, if the second iterate is irreducible, then the fifth iterate is also irreducible. And now we want to go a little bit further. So what about the sixth, seventh, and so on? Um, and yeah, so one, one idea here is to reduce the question whether a n is a square to the question whether a m is a square for a divisor of m. So, and I have a divisor of n, um, and a n of c is a square, then well, a m or minus a m has to be a square. And if m and n have the same parity, then um, we can get rid of the minus sign here. So this allows us to um, reduce the case n equal to six, basically to well n equals three and then the combination of n equals three and n equals two. So if I take n equals six, m equals three, then um, when a six is a square, I know that a three is a square or minus a three is a square, but a three is a square only when c is zero. And for minus a three, I also use that a two of C has to be a square and combining these two things, I get a genus two curve of rank one and it's by now pretty easy to figure out what the rational points are on such a curve. And I mean, this gives the point minus one here. The next one is seven. So seven is a prime number. So we cannot um, use divisors of seven. So we have to work with this curve y squared equals a seven of x directly. But in this case, it turns out that the two Selmer group is trivial, at least assuming the generalized Riemann hypothesis because the polynomial on the right hand side of the curve now has degree, well, if I take the little a seven has degree 63 is irreducible. So I need the class group of the number field of degree 63. And um, this is only feasible assuming GRH. 
Yeah, but otherwise, I mean, if I assume this, the server group is trivial and therefore the group operation points is finite. And we can argue in the same case as for A4, if you remember. So we have just finitely many points on the Jacobian, which we can pull back to the curve and see that this is the only possibility here. Um, yeah, A8 and A9, we can deal with using three and four or four and three. And then 10, um, we have to look at the case that we have that minus A5 is a square. And so we have to look at this curve, which is a quadratic twist of the curve we have been looking at. It's isomorphic or to it over to a joint I. And I mean, we can use that to, to do something similar, which I will not go into here. But the upshot is that um, if we assume that the second iteral is irreducible, what we've done here, so this and this implies that the sixth iteral is also irreducible. And then assuming GRH to get to seven, um, we can even go up to 10. So the 10th iterate is irreducible. And then um, we're going up going further. So one would have to look at A11, but this is the polynomial of degree 1024 or 1023. If, I, if, <coughs> if you sort of turn it around, you get something of odd degree and it's irreducible. So we would have to work with a number field of degree 1023 and um, this is completely impossible at least with the current technology. So this is what we can do regarding this conjecture. Um, so I guess I should finish, but let me just um, mention this, that the same kind of method does work for curves, for, uh, more generally for curves of this form. So if you um, remember the, the expression we had for, for the right hand side, which was x to the 15 plus x to the 7 plus blah, blah, blah squared. So we had a square here of lower degree than this. Um, and the constant term was one. So we only need that it's odd because we do things too adequately. Then one can try to use the same kind of approach to show that the curve has only the obvious three points. Um, and for this, it's, it's essential that one can write down this basis of, of this group here. And um, just as an illustration, um, I've implemented this and then run this on lots of curves, say here. For, for example, I've taken curves of genus five with coefficients of h between minus three and three and H of zero odd, H of one even, positive leading coefficient, coefficient of A of H, sorry. And then, well, you can see that most cases the, the method is successful and shows that these are really the only points. And then um, the remaining cases split well roughly evenly into curves that actually have more points and then curves where it's not successful. Okay, but that's, that's all I wanted to say. So thank you very much for your attention.